think we're going to get started. It's, uh, it's almost a quarter past two. Um, so thank you for coming. This uh, is, as you can see, the City After the Economy. My name is Peter Zellner. I uh, coordinate the sci-fi program with David Bergman to uh, your right and my left. And um, we're uh, very happy to have you here on this uh, uh, combustible afternoon, I guess. I drove in on the 101 this morning and saw a lot of fires out in the east. So hopefully there will be more when we leave. Um, but uh, hopefully we'll have some incendiary conversations this afternoon. Uh, just a little bit about the program. Um, Sci-Fi is our dedicated uh, urban design program here at sci -Arc. We focus on city design, uh, planning, policy. It's a three-year program. And for those of you who are interested or want to enroll, you can talk to David and I uh, a little later. Um, but in particular, what we do here at Sci-Fi, which is the Southern California Institute for Future Initiatives at SciArc, is we look at promoting innovation within the design, policy, planning uh, of cities. And we look to discussions around the futures of global cities. I'm going to fit something in. Um, so uh, this is the first in a series of planned symposium uh, formats, public discussions, public forums that we're going to sponsor. The hope is that we can use these to address the future of the contemporary city. And in particular, we're really interested in promoting the relationship between the program and the community. So we're looking to use these symposia as a forum for an interface between an academic program and ideally the public community. Uh, so with that, um, I'll also just make a few other comments about the program. We also have a journal, which we hope to have out sometime later in 2009. And we have uh, developed something called the Sci-Fi Global Network. This is a peer-based academic research council dedicated to supporting our academic initiatives. Um, and a lot of the members, uh, some of whom are here today, but we'll introduce shortly, are selected from a distinguished field of practitioners, civic leaders, and academics. So the, the hope at Sci-Fi, in a nutshell, is to uh, use the program as an instrument to reach out to broader discussions around the future of the city and its design, and in particular, um, we're very interested in trying to gauge how experimentation in things like civic policy and urban design um, can have impact, quote unquote, in the real world. So let me introduce uh, our panel. Um, to uh, my left, your right, is David Bergen. David is the principal of Economics Research Associates. He is also uh, co-coordinator of the Sci-Fi program, and he will be making a presentation today entitled The Credit Crisis in the City. Uh, we're going to have a remote presentation, which is a little bit of an experiment. We've really never done it here um, at SciArc, and apparently we're using all our mixing channels, I understand, from our AV specialist, John Matt, thank you for setting this up, uh, to make this happen. But Amal and Grouse and Dan Wood, founders and principals of Work AC, a uh, very exciting young firm in New York, also adjunct faculty at Princeton University, will be making a, a virtual presentation through Skype. So we're going to see if this works. Um, hopefully it will but I thank them for their presence. And uh, finally, we have uh, Renee Peralta. Uh, Renee is the architect and uh, founder of uh, Generica, which is a very uh, young and, again, experimental Tijuana-based uh, architecture and urban design practice. He's an associate professor at Woodbury University, uh, School of Architecture in San Diego, the author and editor of Here's Tijuana, and today he'll be presenting Mimetic Acts of Urbanism. Uh, our panelists, and just so we're clear on the structure, uh, our respondents, let's say, uh, today, today's presentations include uh, Joshua Decker. Joshua is an art critic and curator, uh, most recently uh, of a major show at the Santa Monica Museum of Art called, and I'm blanking Josh, Dark Places. Dark places. Uh, he has also recently been appointed the director of the Public Art Studies Program at the USC Roski School of Fine Arts. Unfortunately, we're not joined by Eric Owen Moss today, director of SciArc, who is ill and uh, sends his apologies, or Kevin L. Ratner, who is president of Forest City Residential West. Oh, he's here. Kevin, do you want to join us uh, up here? Or do you want to hang in the, uh, please? Welcome to, thank you for coming. Um, Kevin is president of Forest City Residential West and also a SciArc board member. Thank you for that absolutely. Uh, and finally, Stephanie Smith. Um, maybe you just. Uh, I'll take that one. 
this point. And Stephanie Smith is a SIRE um, uh, faculty member now for uh, probably as long as I've been here. We've been here since the late 90s, I guess. Also a graduate of Harvard University, where she participated uh, in the Harvard Project uh, on the city, led by Ron Kohlhaas. Um, also has worked on uh, Down to Down Journey and is the founder of EcoShack, uh, which is a revolutionary uh, initiative involved in a number of uh, ecologically valuable projects. A new one, uh, which is a starting commune project, I believe, called this act of communes, which Stephanie might talk about a little bit later. So with that, um, let me just make a few uh, opening comments and show you some images. Um, one, of the, one of the ambitions, I, I should say, of this panel uh, is really to mix the kind of formats, languages, and backgrounds, uh, so we have a very broad discussion around the topic of uh, the city. And you, as you can see, our panelists uh, have very varied backgrounds. We have designers, researchers, economists, a developer, um, and uh, an individual in the art world. Uh, and, and the reason for bringing together this kind of varied panel is to kind of broaden the topic of city so that we move away from kind of a singular discussion, perhaps around the issue of economy, to a more multivalent discussion that might take in aesthetics, um, social movements, uh, communities, etc. Um, so, uh, with that, uh, I want to just make a few brief uh, comments and illustrations uh, regarding the state of the economy in relationship to the city. Here's some words that have been in the media uh, a lot lately. Slump, downturn, credit crisis, default, foreclosure, recession, meltdown, bailout, depression, collapse. This is the language of the uh, current contemporary economic landscape, but to a large extent, uh, it's also the language of our urban landscape. It's very clear that in the last year and a half to two years, we've seen a, a very direct relationship between financial instruments and, and urban environments, uh, in particular, as we know, through the uh, subprime mortgage loan crisis. Um, one wonders, though, to what extent the city, or urbanism for that matter, should be defined solely by uh, issues of value and capital, uh, or by speculation. I would offer that perhaps the city is more than the sum of its capital investments, and that might be an interesting place for us to explore the urban consequences of the downturn, as well as consider what urban design opportunities might be revealed by the fiscal slowdown. Some of the questions we're hoping to address uh, today are, uh, what is the status of urban growth and redevelopment in light of the current economy? What effects will re-regulation of financial markets have on real estate, development, urban culture, planning, and architecture? Will planned major public investments, such as the recently improved infrastructure-friendly Measure R, or rumors of an Obama administration-led late model WPA project reinvigorate urban development and perhaps provide us with an alternative to the broken model of privately-led city development? Um, so before we get on to our presentations, uh, first, the bad news. If you've been following uh, the local real estate market, you'd know that yesterday, 70-year-old uh, Irvine-based SunCal companies announced um, that it would be seeking federal bankruptcy protection for two of its premier uh, planned residential developments in Southern California. This one here is the 35-story luxury West Side Tower in um, Santa Monica Boulevard, designed by John Nobel. Um, Faced with the loss of the major investor for new homes, the company now is filing for Chapter 11 uh, protection. Uh, it's also filing for Marblehead, a 313 home planned community on a coastal plateau in San Clemente. Uh, so this follows news in June of uh, a similar filing by the Land Source Communities Development. This is the parent company of the developer building the 15,000 acre New Hall Ranch community near Santa Clarita close to today's fires, actually. Um, again, they filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection last June. And as you may know, the effects of this filing have been pretty widespread, in particular on CalPERS, which is the California Public Employees Retirement System, the largest public pension trust in the United States, directly facing potential losses of $970 million uh, because of investments in land source communities development don't want to see. I think to some extent, we can say that actually these are two local examples that amply demonstrate that both Dubai, uh, sort of Dubai-style boutique developments, such as Nouvelle's $400 million 
177 condo tower, which was aimed primarily at wealthy East Asian and European buyers, as well as massive developments such as the 21,000 home master plan you see here are equally susceptible to the volatility of the market. And certainly, I would think that within that range of development, architecture is somehow uh, at risk and in some ways implicated, I suppose. Um, of course, you know, a lot of these developments can be traced to the sort of delirium of investment that you see here uh, that led us to the subprime crisis. This is the case showing index of historic home values between 1890 and 2000. Um, what it shows is the kind of precipitous roller coaster ride uh, that goes through a series of climbs and drops uh, through World War I, the Great Depression, Second World War II, the 70s and 80s booms, and we see a very rapid ascent, of course, in the late 1990s, which perhaps predictably, uh, like most roller coaster rides, leads to an extreme ride down. And we see here from 2000 to 2008 uh, the devastating effects that. Uh, the credit crisis has had on the value of homes uh, nationwide. If we look in more detail, uh, this is an analysis of uh, the collapse of home values across 20 major centers. Um, and you see huge adjustments, for instance, in new suburban areas like Phoenix and Las Vegas. But you also see declines in traditional urban areas like Boston and New York. So this would be the zoom in. And this is, takes us to the end of 2007 and presumably the bottom has not been reached, so I guess the lines would probably consider, continue to extend downward from the right-hand side. All of this makes you wonder if cities need protective economic caps. Uh, this is Buckminster Fuller's ambitious idea to place a geodesic dome over New York City. Maybe it was not so far-fetched after all. The most important reason for Fuller in building this geodesic dome was to keep the weather out, but perhaps it also could have kept the economy out as well. Um, one of the interesting aspects, I suppose, of talking about cities is our ability to sort of speculate on their future, and also to speculate on them, not just, again, as economic structures, but also as cultural constructs. Um, so to conclude, uh, I just wanted to present this image. This is, uh, I think, quite iconic. It's the Cartel Tower in Tijuana. Uh, it's a project that was started in the late 1990s, um, reputedly by a major drug lord in, in, in uh, northern Mexico. Uh, it was halted when the owner uh, was jailed, and it now sits uh, adjacent to the border. Um, supposedly, it was built as a kind of lookout tower, so it's called the Cartel Watchtower, disguised as a commercial building. Um, it's an interesting parable, I think, for our own time, perhaps an inversion of the usual logics of development, it was illegally funded, built in a downturn, and now stands as a kind of big icon of an alternate economy. Um, it raises some pertinent questions about the purpose of architecture and what we define as urban economy, what we call a city, uh, and in fact, what we think urbanism actually might be in light of the current state of financial affairs. So with that, I'm going to uh, give the floor over to David Bergen. His presentation is The Credit Crisis and the City. Well, uh, I will try to be brief for no other reason than it's best to deliver bad news quickly, I suppose. Uh, what I'd like to do here is to discuss uh, what's happening in credit markets and how they're affecting the built environment, a little bit about how we got here and what it means, uh, and a little bit about what it might mean for you all, uh, both as practitioners in the field and people who live in cities. So uh, those are my sort of overarching topics, and, and I want to move through this quickly so that we can get to the discussion of the panel. If you have questions, please let me know. Uh, one of the great things about being an economist, right, is that you get to say things that are obvious, and they sound profound. Uh, and uh, the critical observation that we have right now is that job growth is now negative, That's, that unemployment is rising. Uh, we know that capital markets are in turmoil, and uh, that we had a contraction in the national gross domestic product in the third quarter of a third of a percent. However, this ends in September, which is really when uh, 
we went down the rabbit hole. So we know that quarter four will be considerably worse. Uh, we found out that the subprime uh, market, lending market on residential real estate was not the whole problem after all. And actually, if I can go aside from these bullet points, the whole source of the problem comes from looking at the built environment, architecture, real estate, whatever it is you want to call it, place, community, and divorcing it from those qualitative differences that imply everything from its performance to its non-market values and premiums that come from design or location or adjacencies and turning it into a commodity such that a square foot of commercial space is a square foot of commercial space. A residential for sale dwelling unit is one single family dwelling unit. And turning this very real world of the city and the built environment that does represent a fixed capital investment and taking it and turning it into a commodity. And this commodification of the city through the real estate development process really happened through the creation of a whole variety of commercial mortgage bank securities, and then finally through uh, securitization of residential mortgages. And this created an environment that uh, wiped out the specificity or values, the qualitative values of the built environment. It created a national market and a global market for real estate where in the reality is that the transactions are intensely local and take place at the community level. So um, this became very greatly accelerated uh, for a number of reasons over the last several years. Uh, right now, commercial real estate, which makes up uh, two-thirds of the uh, value of, of the built environment, is mostly in balance. Uh, there isn't a tremendous oversupply of uh, product, except for in certain sectors like hotels and uh, retail sectors. Um, residential is, of course, a source of a tremendous amount of unmet, uh, uh, you know, unabsorbed inventory. Uh, we have uh, significant in, in inventories, and there's a lot of regional variation. So if you look at the statistics on the case Shiller Index for, say, California, how they might often be reported, that's going to talk about a circumstance like Merced or Hammett or some of these other real exurban communities where you may be looking at uh, preponderance to a majority between 40 and 60 percent of built housing stock uh, not occupied. Uh, two circumstances in Los Angeles County and coastal California where markets have softened a little bit, but we are not uh, seeing people walking away from, uh, from housing to that extent. So clearly we're in a recession, and this recession is being driven by uh, issues related to real estate investment. And the big question is, will this recession be U-shaped or L-shaped? What do I, we've given up hope on V-shaped, right? V-shaped as you come down real quick and you bounce back up. Uh, U-shaped uh, average uh, recession in the post-war American economy is 10 months. So these are sort of normal events, and we live through them, and they're not pleasant. Uh, and they take about uh, uh, 10 months to work itself out, and this is a U-shaped uh, recession. Are we going to have a U-shaped recession? There's a couple of things that I think you all should look for in determining that. Uh, one is this notion of decoupling. Is the financial crisis in the United States that's now generalizing as into an economic crisis in the US? Uh, is there contagion to other economies globally? Early on in this process, we thought, hey, maybe there wasn't. Uh, this week, maybe we think that decoupling was a little bit of wishful thinking. So maybe we, we check that one off. Uh, are the central bank efforts going to be successful, particularly the extension of credit facilities to non-depository uh, non institutions? This is this huge expansion of Federal Reserve's lending power to support insurance industry and AIG, and also part and parcel of that is the $700 billion bailout. Well, maybe this will be successful, although we've already had a reinvention just this week where we've learned that now we're not going to buy undervalued and underperforming assets. We're going to be buying equity 
these gigs as the public in the banks themselves. So another one for the L to for the U to, to take off the, 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 the hope list. The final thing to take a look at is whether job losses particularly stabilize or if they begin to increase. Remember, two thirds of the American gross domestic product is made up by consumer spending. So not only does the uptake of the built environment tie directly to uh, employment levels, uh, but our overall uh, economy runs on consumption, and the absence of that consumption is a serious problem. So what is L? An L-shaped uh, L -shaped recession is one where you drop very quickly and you bounce across the bottom for a long period of time. The classic example is the lost decade in Japan. It was also triggered by a financial crisis in the real estate industry where fictitious capital was created and the banks were not forced to write it down and very difficult for capital to flow out to, the, to more productive sectors of the economy. Um, things to watch for in this are failures of central bank policy, uh, global weakness, in particular in China, for a variety of reasons. And also, now that we're seeing these rapid declines in oil prices, are we going to see a retreat of sovereign wealth much of which was being funded by petrodollar investments, so uh, from Dubai, from the other parts of the UAE, uh, from um, some, interestingly enough, also growing in some parts of the developed world that had oil resources, underdeveloped world that had oil resources, such as Angola and, uh, and Indonesia, uh, to see if whether or not this is, it has been a crutch, for example, that has funded real estate projects, including Providing construction financing for the EMAR from the holdings of the uh, Sheikh Mohammed of uh, Dubai for the Grand Avenue project. So we may be looking more at an L than a U, but this is a moving target. It's changing daily and hourly. So commercial real estate, think a little bit about this. Uh, unlike the last time we had a crisis in real estate development, which was in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, its commercial development has been uh, relatively disciplined. Most markets are in balance. Uh, I remember it took about six years. We, we borrowed six years of growth in that last boom that resolved itself in the savings and loan crisis. Uh, it took about six years for all of that to be absorbed uh, for new development. Right now, the big areas that are overdeveloped are retail, in particular lifestyle, destination, discretionary spending destinations, and uh, also hotels, in particular class B hotels, like you know, you get off a freeway interchange, now you see the Hampton Inn and the Courtyard by Marriott, and uh, all of those products, right? When you got three of those on each clover leaf, we've got too many of those. Uh, the important thing to recognize from all of this is that the demand for commercial real estate is going to continue to be subject to employment growth and occupancy. Um, lacks underwriting, uh, which is particularly uh, leading to the so-called subprime mess um, that uh, led to an accelerated rate rate of residential foreclosures. Here's the problem: that's always expected in a recession that there's a big run-up in foreclosures. Uh, however, this began during the expansion in you know, 06 and 07, so it's going to be like rocket fuel once we enter a uh, recession to rapidly increase this, uh, this uh, rates of default and uh, need to work out uh, the rest of the residential market. Um, and this has had contagion to commercial markets. I don't need to bother you with the details, but uh, essentially it's become impossible for even good projects to be financed. For example, uh, public bonds for infrastructure now are having to pay at a three and a half uh, times ten, multiple on the 10-year treasury note. Historically, it's between one and a half and two times that value. So this is uh, some mark, some uh, even publicly banked debt is failing at auction altogether. Uh, a group of uh, quasi-governmental uh, uh, organizations, such as the Metropolitan Museum of Art and some other authorities in New York, went uh, recently about two or three weeks ago to market to an auction market for a capital campaign, for capital improvements that were going to be financed that failed to receive any uh, bids at, at auction. So this is the kind of commercial 
debt that would have, or publicly backed, quasi publicly backed debt that would have been quickly absorbed in the market. And that's called, and construction financing is essentially meant for us. Uh, okay. Well, there have been dislocations like this in capital markets in the past, and the city and the real estate development and architecture and urbanism has recovered in North America. We can think of a couple. Uh, the first too big to fail, of course, was Continental Illinois. Uh, that's where the phrase came that we had to save Continental Illinois and, 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 it, and its mess. And that tipped off a financial crisis that lasted for about two years in the mid 80s. Uh, the SNL crisis uh, that led to the creation of the Resolution Trust Corporation led to a massive real estate driven recession in the late 80s, early 90s. We also, more recently, just within the last 10 years, have seen the Asian financial crisis and long-term capital management's collapse in 97. Typically, these things take about a year or two to work out, uh, and eventually banks get recapitalized and, and, uh, and uh, we get going again. Is this one going to mirror the historical experience? And it's looking like it's not, mostly based on changes to central bank policies uh, and the fact that at a certain point financial crashes become generalized to the broader economy. A financial panic or crash doesn't have to lead to a depression, but they can if that contagion isn't properly maintained and that's the fear. That's a graph that should be uh, familiar to those of you that are practicing and of concern uh, for those of you about to enter practice this is net change in billings month on month, month from AIA uh, for architectural services. So um, essentially, we can, we've got severe contractions in, in demands for built products in the built environment across a whole variety of uses, infrastructure, institutional, public-private partnership, all of the kinds of things that generally grind along even during recessions, have come to a complete stop. Well, what's happening? How do we get here? Um, and the answer is this is a cyclical crisis of capitalism. This is something that's endemic as the process of capitalism goes through a process where there is an expansion, an overaccumulation, and eventually a correction. It's also an overcorrection phase that's usually an opportunity to make a little bit of money. But if we look here, this is on the blue line, which comes from the U.S. Federal Reserve and the U.S. Uh, Department of uh, uh, U.S. Uh, Department of Commerce Bureau of Economic Analysis, and this measures the value of fixed capital stock in trillions of dollars in the U.S. economy, right, on an annual basis. And we have data here from 1990 to uh, through 2007. And uh, this isn't households, this is commercial real estate. This is its notational value, notional value. And then you compare that to a 25 year trend, which has been growing about 4.6%. What that means is that everything above that red line is essentially surplus value, generally created through what leverage or finance capital or, or fictitious capital. And uh, we, uh, my belief, and the whole school of economists' belief, are that in the long run in capitalism you have um, long-term uh, returns to the mean, right? That there's a, there's a, that this brown line here can change due to structural changes in the economy. But absent those structural changes that are mostly driven by technology or population or overall change to the structure of the mode of accumulation in the society, your long run long run profits are going to converge. It's a little bit like the law of thermodynamics. You can't win, you can't break even, and you can't get out of the game. All of this value between the brown line and the blue line is going to have to be unwound. That's where we're at today. So that's what's going on. It's very painful. Uh, and the problem is, is that real estate, why did this happen in real estate? Is that real estate is an ideal vehicle for the conversion of finance capital or, or, or leverage or what Marx called fictitious capital, a way to turn it into fixed capital. <clears throat> there have been huge run-ups in profitability 
uh, in, uh, in the global capital system in the last decade. And there are three reasons for this. One is a tremendous increase in productivity. This is the internet computer revolution. So much, so many of us are able to do so much more uh, than we could an hour's worth of labor than we could have even a decade ago. Think of all of the uh, draftsmen that have been replaced by cat operators that are now replaced by one or two people working with uh, your software packages that your parametric building packages that you're learning here today. Some of you are doing the work of what two decades ago would have been a whole department you on your desk. At the same time, wages are stagnant. This has led to increasing uh, profits to capital, as well as a big run up in commodity prices for a variety of reasons. So what happened to all this capital? We had to do something with it, right? And it went into real estate. Um, and households became an outlet for this, uh, particularly those that had uh, there were opportunities to loosen up the underwriting criteria. So all of this excess capital began pouring in to the built environment into the city, causing an over-accumulation and over-production of space on a massive scale. One thing that I think is important to talk about is that these crises are endemic to capitalism. And um, over time, when you get a divorce between the price of something and its utility or use value, that's that speculative range. And over time, it will, it, the markets and the converging rate of profits will force that together in a crisis. And it all stems from this notion of looking at the built environment, real estate, architecture as commodity, rather than looking at it as qualitative values. And the other issue is it's not a product that you can particularly stimulate over demand, generally speaking. I'll give you an example of what I mean by this. Uh, a factory, a manufacturer, is they need 100,000 square feet of space. They're not going to demand 125,000 square feet. If you have 250 square feet in an office building for an employee, you're not going to occupy more space than your head can. Yes, you have a little bit of planning built in for expansion or contraction, but for the most part, it's pretty tight. Interestingly enough, you can kind of do this with households by turning the dwelling place into a consumer good, just like an iPod or a car or something like that. And there's no secret that the whole sort of cultural move towards lifestyle television channels, towards home renovation, uh, architecture shelter magazines, uh, star architecture, trophy buildings for residential development, all of this is coinciding with stimulating a market demand in some respects of overconsumption. And it can be the Daniel Leibskin Tower in Sacramento to the three family household occupying 3,000 square foot built straight to the lot line in Manhattan Beach. So what happens is it stimulates this, this overconsumption. And there's a crash now. And uh, I'm the guy on the left there. I'm just riding on the business cycle. Uh, if I, you know, if I had the answer to these questions, I'd be the guy on the right. Um, something will happen to pull us out of it. Um, I don't know what it will be. In the past, there have been key sectors. In the 80s, it was defense and commercial real estate. Of course, there was a collapse, the savings and loan crisis, and the end of the Cold War. Uh, in the 90s and 2000s, it was technology and the internet, and we had dot com collapse after that. In the early 2000s, it was residential real estate. We were in that collapse. So what's next? Conventional energy, alternative energy, green technologies, healthcare, commodities, something unexpected. No way to know. But that's where we're headed. And I uh, look forward to talking with the panel a little bit more about what the uh, sort of implications of this baseline data are for our cities and communities and where we go and how we approach it with the skills we have as architects. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna try something very different now. Um, I have uh, Dan Wood and Amal 
going to drive myself online, I'm going to put the sound on. Uh, they're going to present 49 cities, which is a draft for a publication they're working on. Let me see if this is going to work. After the economy, um, um, thank you for the invitation. Um, and David, thank you for this great introduction. Uh, we just had uh, one of our main projects cancelled, uh, <laughs> an hour ago, so uh, we're, we're in this together. Um, but um, maybe uh, to sort of uh, pick up on uh, what Peter uh, said in his introduction. Um, what should the city necessarily be um, just a, a, some of its capital? Um, and uh, in the past four years, sort of uh, stepping away a bit from the hype um, um, around uh, mapping urbanization and, and the issues of ecology, etc., we um, started to look at uh, the relationship between ecology and urbanism um, through uh, teaching at, at Princeton uh, seminar, uh, looking at that relationship. And uh, moving backwards almost from practice, um, we, uh, we, we, in a way, started to take this opportunity to, uh, uh, and maybe this is a great opportunity to do that uh, in the context today, to rethink the city. Um, so we wanted to illustrate some of that work uh, that uh, is ongoing uh, with a, a book to be published called 49 Cities uh, that you can see on, on the screen. And the idea, of course, as uh, most of us know, talk to the work, um, is that um, I mean, architects and urbanists have been thinking about cities for centuries. And at least in the West, uh, sometimes in the 70s, for a number of reasons, um, the thinking about cities uh, stopped. Uh, and we've just kind of been in this uh, yes uh, economy of uh, massive urbanization. And yet, um, throughout um, time, the issues of uh, population growth, of um, balancing between the built and the unbuilt, uh, uh, kind of the human presence, print, uh, issues of density, et cetera, have always been an issue. Um, and so we feel that this is a time where we can start to rethink these issues uh, so that it's not just about the economy, but it's about uh, uh, social implications, political implications, uh, and ecological implications. Uh, what you see on the uh, next, slide. next slide is uh, a timeline, uh, it, we call it the fear timeline, uh, where sort of uh, different movements uh, and different visionary cities were created as a reaction to fear, um, whether war or um, depression or um, um, sort of a fear of pollution, etc. Et and you can see towards the end of the uh, timeline, somehow in the, you know, in the 70s, it kind of think it stops. Um, just to illustrate how we've uh, uh, sort of looked at these cities, um, we selected 49 cities uh, from 100 of the cities that we looked at um, just to kind of create a, a, a data of a very different cities, some built, some visionary, uh, um, and some past, and some more recent. Of course, the Roman city. Okay, next, next slide. Next slide, you can see the Roman city. Um, so every city gets a chart uh, where we mapped uh, um, we redrew a kind of typical plan uh, section, uh, um, tried to find information about population, uh, density, uh, amount of green space, uh, infrastructure, etc. So, um, to be able to start to compare what the, these uh, some temporary cities uh, were intended to produce as a, as a way of living. Um, we sort of discovered more 
uh, unknown cities. This is a city for um, Dusseldorf by a woman named Merite Vatern, a kind of very organic sort of a pre habitat uh, 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 idea of a city um, that would be incredibly uh, dense and, uh, in this case, sort of organic. Yeah. And <laughs> looking at the field. Um, Chicago, um, help Alzheimer's plan for Sh yeah, the Chicago slide. Chicago slide, next slide. Um, it's a you know one of the numerous precursor to uh, the suburban uh, sort of explosion uh, in the U.S. where the idea of the suburb is uh, uh, was to uh, uh, simply uh, uh, diminish uh, the amount of death in case of bombing of uh, high density uh, cities. And next slide, uh, we had some surprises as well uh, in terms of some of the cities that we examined. We uh, felt that probably Solari would be uh, right down into compression and density. Uh, and in fact, despite uh, all its imagery, uh, we found it quite undense and uncompressed and uh, uh, not so micro uh, uh, in its, in its, in its kind of planning. Um, all, next slide. Next slide. All of the cities and their plans, uh, and of course the, the, the city forms are, are also interesting. Let's try to take on a bit more ecological lens. Uh, are, we managed to sort of uh, redraw them all to scale to start to uh, analyze what, what is the kind of possible appropriate scale for 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 a city. Um, and looking at population densities, uh, sort of ranking them. Uh, uh, next slide, next slide, should be a green space now. Percentage uh, of, of green space, um, and uh, so we're kind of right now starting to formulate not so much uh, conclusions, but uh, rather uh, maybe certain, uh, try, try to come up with some questions uh, as to how we start conceptualizing uh, 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 where to move forward, uh, assuming that things are changing already. Uh, um, um, suburbia is a uh, failed uh, infrastructure, may or, or may not be rethought. Thoughtfully, uh, there will be stimulus to rethink infrastructure, etc., etc. So, we uh, feel this is the right moment to start rethinking all of these issues uh, from kind of more uh, general perspective. Uh, on the next slide, this is uh, we, we did find one thing uh, that maybe is a precedent for more ecological cities. Uh, surprisingly, uh, next slide, Radiant City uh, by Corbusier came up in the top 10 of kind of density, amount of green space, uh, FAR, and total population. So in a way, Radiant City, to our surprise, became the overall winner uh, of, all our, of all our cities. Um, and we decided to take a little bit closer look and see, you know, why, why it was kind of so interesting and maybe so ecological. Uh, Corbusier, next slide, uh, Corbusier himself called Reading City, the Ville Vest, the Critic, and we kind of discovered or probably rediscovered um, on the next slide uh, is that really instead of ours in the park, which is how Corbusier is traditionally read, um, his writing and his imagery, this is, this is a slide, for example, that accompanied uh, text that said this is what the the open days of our great cities might be like, um, really was not so much towers in the park, but really kind of city in wilderness. And uh, there was a kind of much more wild and uh, naturalistic uh, intention, let's say. Uh, and we can on the next slide, we see a model. Well, the idea of the city in wilderness is something that's really exciting and, and potentially inspiring. On the next slide, uh, you can see, these are the residential units. This was our kind of second surprise, looking back at the Lourdes. Um, which was that uh, not only did Corbusier grid the playing fields, so the residential units are the black and white stripes, and then in between are the game fields, the jib fields. Um, and uh, so, of course, everyone knows that he was all into sports. But then behind that, we were kind of to discovered there was an entire strip of uh, basically urban farming. And the idea was that workers would come from home. Uh, do their sports, of course, and then uh, and then actually work in the fields. And uh, every hundred uh, units was received by a farmer, and there was a real idea about uh, production of, uh, of food in the Radiant City. Uh, so in a way, uh, we were kind of interested to find uh, that as a precedent. On the next slide. Next slide is a sort of an uh, idea we are working on. Uh, we call it the urbanization. This is uh, maybe us dreaming of a better future. <laughs> Uh, but the, the notion of urbanization is to uh, 
uh, yeah, next slide, uh, sort of take a, 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 some time to go back to um, how the uh, kind of notion of uh, town country and town country sort of started. This is a museum. Country was beautiful, but um, poor, and so the town country, in a way, the precursor of the suburb, um, was to be, you know, the ideal of both um, um, coming together. Um, uh, but in effect, next slide, um, this ideal uh, uh, became, rather than being contained as the town, uh, as the garden cities were connected by sort of trains and infrastructure, sort of very formalized, uh, very compressed footprints. Uh, it, you know the. The Garden City is really today the the new the three magnets would be uh, urban, rural, and a suburban, ex-urban, you know, sprawl. I'm sort of uh, and so uh, you know again assuming things things may change, things should change because of uh, you know environmental issues. But even with the economy today, things might change. We may come back. Or, or, or a model that may be more interesting to pursue uh, would be what we call this urbanization model, where the suburb sort of disappears in a way, uh, and uh, uh, basically we come back to a two-pole um, situation where uh, we need to rethink the city on, on the one hand to try and reintegrate some of the systems uh, uh, closer to the city, uh, it could be the city, uh, urban farming. Etc. Uh, while on the other hand, at the same time, simultaneously rethink the rural um, as well, uh, you know, rethink uh, food farming infrastructure, etc., for the rural at the same time. And so, um, looking at the impact on the city, obviously there has been some kind of uh, precedents in terms of the cities and places that have to. You should be on the urban farming slide now. The urban farming in 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 the. In Cuba, um, where the entire cities, uh, Havana, etc., were uh, sort of formed to um, basically allow for urban farming to occur, which is kind of a very successful uh, model in, in terms of uh, um, local population and limiting transportation. Um, on the next slide, there's some uh, uh, smaller, uh, uh, you know, again, if we're thinking as architects and urbanists of uh, ways to intervene. Uh, in the next economy, there's some kind of smaller, more localized interventions. Uh, um, this is a, a, a pretty famous uh, urban farm here in, in Brooklyn, Red Hook, uh, sort of appropriating uh, infrastructure to, to grow farming. Um, and on the next slide, um, this was a sketch proposal um, that we did for, uh, for New York Magazine uh, called the uh, Look Fantasia, uh, which uh, was to bring together uh, not some much in farming, but rather sort of a terrorist farming, uh, urban farming with uh, housing for farmers and uh, all sort of hosted by Brancusi culture, uh, supported with the Brancusi sculpture is a, and a farmer's market. But it's sort of really rethink uh, fundamentally what it means to develop in the city and how to integrate. Um, we also are interested, I mean, architects at the same time in the past have looked at rural uh, conditions. This is Fukawa's agricultural city in the 60s, a great um, sort of modern system for housing and, uh, farmers that a very minimal footprint uh, um, to be uh, implemented in various uh, um, situations. Um, on the next slide, uh, again, Le Corbusier did not just think that the city, he also thought the radiant farm and we, you know, trying to rethink how this farm could uh, create a, a very sustainable system. Um, today, there's some interesting uh, thinking uh, of the slide, next slide uh, regarding uh, farming, organic farming, which is turning out to be much more uh, um, sort of potentially productive. And so, we've been uh, working with our students mapping the systems, you know, uh, that, that uh, farming, uh, organic farming, sustainable farming uh, can use, where it's really about uh, rotation and movement and. and Flexibility and that there's something uh, to be learned there in terms of rethinking the city uh, almost uh, sort of in parallel uh, as something that is much more of a system that's integrated. And uh, since we're going to run out of work, we're going to uh, next slide propose uh, to redesign the, uh, uh, this famous uh, farmer 
made famous through uh, Michael Pollan's book, uh, Omnivore's Dilemma, of Salatin who uh, designed his own chicken coop. So I, we feel he might, uh, we might serve him well, maybe. Uh, okay, we don't have um, much more, but uh, we just want to show a couple projects where we are working with this idea of urbanization, of the combination of uh, uh, rethinking our cities through the integration of more rural aspects. Uh, and, and along that, uh, really to uh, talk about infrastructure and systems uh, that really, in order to uh, kind of deal with the larger problems of global climate change and economic meltdown, really we need to get inspired by uh, both infrastructure and systems, uh, kind of harking back with the Romans um, on, the, on that slide. And then on the next slide, um, just as a kind of reminder, the, the uh, metabolists in, in uh, Tokyo in the 60s, this is um, uh, Tokyo Bay uh, by Kanzo Tange. Um, really, projects that were inspired by this idea of infrastructure. This is a bridge project. On the next slide is maybe uh, something interesting as we all suffer from economic meltdown, which is that uh, Curitiba is a city in Brazil which was kind of too poor to uh, afford a subway system, and so uh, their city has developed along uh, bus lines. And so the entire form of the city is really informed by a kind of unique take on bus transportation. On the next slide, uh, which is our introductory slide, just very quickly going to go through um, projects completed for the next slide. Hudson Yards Park, which is a nine block uh, area of the city next to the Javits Center. And um, what we wanted to do there, working together with Almori Associates, landscape architects, and Fritz Haig, the artist, uh, to really create a park that really emphasized this idea of artifice and nature and try to in contradict, uh, in comparison to the old view of a park where nature is a certain sectional difference and instead of kind of creating a natural section to insert program uh, underneath the park so that the park itself plays on this idea of natural and artifice. And the next slide, uh, the other thing we also want to do, this is an image by Fritz Haig, is to encourage animal habitats and to really emphasize this idea of wilderness for the park so that the park itself becomes a kind of wilderness insertion within the city. On the next slide we see a model showing all of the buildings uh, and the park in the middle. So the idea was these kind of strips of program and material uh, that created kind of varied topography across. On the next slide uh, is an example of one of the systems that we're working with, which is water. Uh, we take the water from the buildings around and water uh, for irrigation, for biofiltration. Uh, all of the conveyance of the water would be visible, creating kind of pipe benches and pipe walkway. It's a water park and kind of culminate a large cistern at the end. And on the last slide, we see uh, all of this kind of coming together, this kind of natural slash artificial slash wildlife slash habitat slash city slash park slash competition that we would be lost. Next slide. <laughs> uh, we're big on Play Doh these days. Um, um, the last, last quick project uh, we'd like to show that is a, a, a kind of a micro, uh, micro piece of uh, sort of uh, what we're trying to think about is Public Farm One, the installation we did for PS1 uh, that just came down summer. Um, basically, what we were interested in really sort of, next slide, uh, um, you know, kind of questioning the, the program and, and using this opportunity uh, to uh, uh, rethink uh, the city, obviously, at this very small scale. Scale, but I think uh, bring in these issues of infrastructure and sort of layer the agricultural grid and the urban grid uh, in a way. And kind of this sort of uh, first idea was to create a kind of farm bridge that would span both uh, courtyards at PS1. Um, obviously, uh, the farm bridge would have been too heavy. Next slide, and so it became a sort of folded structure that allowed for activities and social life underneath. So it's a sort of doubling, layering uh, in terms of the possibility of the city of having uh, growth on one side, infrastructure, but also kind of social and interaction. I won't go into much detail, uh, but just uh, next next slide is next the slide. construction detail. We use cardboard tubes. Well, next slide just shows the cardboard tube the planters and the structure uh, for, for, for the installation. Um, next slide, the roof, uh, the roof uh, became the, uh, the farm with 51 varieties of, of plant. And, well, next slide, underneath the structural columns, the cardboard columns that extended uh, and started to hold programs, uh, farm sounds, videos, etc., phone charging machines, uh, uh, juicers for parties, really creating kind of uh, a, a social life underneath the underneath the farm. Um, next, 
said. Um, the entire structure was solar powered um, using batteries, but you know the phone charging, the, all the video, etc., was um, solar powered. And at the same time, uh, we were able, next slide, to collect all of the water from PS1 uh, and use drip irrigation uh, to sort of uh, water the entire uh, the entire uh, pool. Most importantly, uh, next slide here, you see the the structure as it was this summer uh, with this sort of folded plane that uh, kind of. Uh, 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 sort of links the links the two courtyards with the pool in the middle. Um, next slide. Um, I'm just looking at the the under sections. The most important part uh, in the way of the project was that it really became about collaboration. Uh, a lot of the plan. Uh, uh, in one of the urban farms in New York and Queens, called the Queens County Farm Museum. Uh, uh, but at the same time, we grew some of the plants on Rikers Island. Uh, we're through the greenhouse uh, program. Um, next slide, here another image. Uh, and so uh, the uh, sort of ex uh, uh, uh were the farmers throughout the throughout the summer. Um, next slide, and here you see the kind of uh, sort of layering of the of the city and the, and the farm. And uh, next slide, we did uh, bring in real chickens uh, at PS1. Uh, that were there all summer producing eggs uh, uh, and collaborated uh, very happily next slide with the uh, tens, then thousands of uh, uh, sort of party years uh, that occupied the site. Um, next slide, the last slide. Sorry we went a little over. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> to at least formally become something else. And this is, of course, the city of Tijuana, a city that's always uh, been categorized or thought of as this other. An other between its own country, within its own country, in Mexico, but also another um, in relationship to the United States, uh, more particularly in relationship to California and San Diego. So it's in between this um, conflict, I'll say, um, of identity. And therefore, uh, there was a president of Mexico on time ago who said, poor Tijuana, so far from God, so close to the United States. <laughs> <laughs> so just briefly, just to get some context, uh, I mean, this is a series of ideas. Uh, I'll try to be within the 15 minute limits because there's so many things. Uh, there's just a series of ideas of how uh, as an architect, uh, basically I'm trying to understand the place where I work or the place where I live. Um, so it'll be a mismatch of many things. Uh, but first of all, just to give you an idea, of course, this is a brief history of the U.S.-Mexico border, uh, a brief history basically of conflict. Uh, and this is sort of the creation of the city of the city of the other. On the top you see, of course, uh, uh, pretty recently absolute uh, uh, you know, ad that basically shows what Mexico's extension was uh, before the Mexican-American War. Uh, if you look to your right, you see how basically the bottom um, half of those maps, after the Treaty of Guadalupe, uh, Mexico lost half of its territory, or well, actually uh, the U.S. paid Mexico $10 million for half of its territory. Uh, so, and it, there were a series of changes to the border, basically by 1959, 1859, I'm sorry, there was another treaty, the Ganson Treaty, that basically gave part of the Rockies and, uh, 
to uh, the United States and other lands between Texas that would be able later to have a railroad that would connect the east side of the United States, California, east to west. Uh, so there was a series of purchases, but it's all based, or actually was done uh, after uh, the Mexican American War. Um, but uh, let's, uh, that's a very brief uh, little history. But the border today is, uh, there's many different notions of it. You know, there's experiences and uh, representations of, of space and time collide and resonate uh, within our construct of our reality at least us in uh, where we live in, in Tijuana. For some, the borderlands have become the uh, epitome of a kind of post-urban space, like of uh, my friend Michael Beer here at USC, where others such as uh, local uh, writers like Heriberto Yepes, uh, for him, any postmodern or any post-anything uh, is an illusory, a kind of, a kind of illusion of view of totality, uh, sort of like reducing any land, any earth, to a quantifiable knowledge, uh, a kind of what he calls an imperialistic dream. Uh, but the border is about basically time, time spans, relationships, uh, times uh, and systems of control uh, that morph between geography uh, and time itself, sort of what Paulo Rilo calls uh, chronographies, where everything is measured in time as sequences and in control zones, such as a border and then and it generates a sort of an anxiety and fragment and some powerless. So instead of thinking of the border zone as this area of flows, we're actually, the border is really a place of stagnation because of the border you wait. You wait going south and now, <clears throat> you wait going north and now you wait even going south if you look at the picture on the bottom. And over here you see that the border, instead of being creating this sort of postmodern myth of the two places that come together and basically become a region uh, have been now, uh, basically, is, is now part of a three-border or three-wall system. Very quickly, I just want to go to a uh, through a couple of ideas of what, uh, how the border has been basically conceptualized. Uh, first of all, it's a postmodern laboratory. Hybridities in La Frontera Portátil, or the portable border, uh, Canclini, uh, Nestor Garcia Canclini, an Argentinian sociologist in the 90s, uh, said basically that Tijuana was a postmodern laboratory and it was actually a great experience or case of hybridity in a cultural sense. So hybridity was actually the places where process of combining discrete social structures uh, would come and sort of create new ones. So Tijuana, San Diego, California, Mexico, this was the place, the border was actually that place. So what happens in these places to create hybridity, well there's the loss of any relationships between culture, geography, and social territories. But then again, new, new relocations, new creations of new and symbolic productions. Uh, so it, it's, it's a very happy idea that two things come together and create a third one. Now, uh, in ur uh, urbanistic, urbanistic terms, Michael Deere basically has this force border ideology to sort of, uh, it matches a little bit what Canclini is talking about. Because for him, uh, cities uh, go from post-industrial to post-modern to post-border. For him, the border is something portable that you take with you. It's not something physical anymore. So there's a hybridis uh, hybridization, hybridization I'm sorry, at a city region scale. So for him, the typologies of the 19th century city are no longer valid to explain this idea of mobility and this idea of hybridity. And for him, the cities of the 21st century are the world city, the cyber city, the dual city the hybrid city and the sustainable city. So these are uh, very important or two ways of explaining sort of what the uh, conceptualizations of the border are. Now, there's a, there's a contracting effect, uh, basically, that tries to sort of break this idea of what this region is or, it's not, or that it's not even a region. Uh, so according to um, the geographer Tito Legria from Tijuana, uh, the transporter region is a, it's non-existent. And the, and the, uh, the reasons are very interesting and they're mostly economic because uh, there's differentiation problems in practice and planning. Basically, there's no such thing as binational planning and urban problems are not related. The only problems that we share between the United States or San Diego, Tijuana, California, Baja California are actually ecological issues. And those are, uh, mostly those issues are problems, basically. Uh, goods and services are produced in certain areas of the region, but not consumed by all inhabitants. 
So good participates in two systems of relative pricing. So basically, there's a lot of manufacturing plants in the city of Tijuana that make televisions. There was a time when Tijuana was actually called the capital, the world capital of televisions. Um, but what does that mean? That most of the TVs were made down there, but we weren't able to buy them. They had to leave the country, and basically, uh, these were goods. Uh, they were sold other places. We could not be able to participate uh, in somehow to gain these goods. Uh, and of course, international limitations. There's this myth also that Tijuana is the most crossed uh, border in the world. Uh, there's uh, 60 million crossings a year, but really, uh, Tijuana, only 50% of its inhabitants can legally cross the border. So we're talking that these crossings are somehow uh, uh, businessmen or people who can cross this other 50% to go back and forth two or three times a day. Now, that's sort of the, uh, very briefly, because I don't have much time, sort of the, um, some of the notes on, on how this transporter fallacy or hybridity idea has been um, rejected. And uh, just very philosophically, uh, Eliberto Jeffes, who's a, a young writer from Tijuana, which I did the author of the book, Here's Tijuana, with him, he basically says the border is a space of contradictions and paradoxical effects, and I think that's very important. Tijuana is made of contradictions on both sides, contradictions with the North and contradictions with the South. The hybridity discourse is tied to a Hegelian idea of synthesis, so basically, these two things don't come together and create a happy third one. Actually, these things never come together. They're always in conflict. I mean, culturally, socially, and economics, no? on both sides of the border. Through the illusion of hybridism, contradiction is obscured, turned into a sort of commodity. And then Tijuana is built by contradictory versions about Tijuana. So um, that is uh, very, very important in sort of the making of a sort of a myth in a way. But uh, leaving a little bit of this idea of the hybrid, I want to go into something that we're working on with uh, the anthropologist uh, Fiamma Montesemolo, which is this idea of mimet, uh, mimesis or mimetic acts of urbanism, where the city, because it's so aware that it's always a, an, an, an other, it's always so, so very different, it tries to take shape and form um, of either another culture or another city, et cetera, et cetera. So these are just some of the examples. On the bottom, there's a really interesting one I was uh, driving down Tijuana and some uh, conservative talk radio says LA is turning into an Tijuana and all cities in the United States are becoming LA. Uh, so we'll talk about a little bit about that idea. Um, just to give you a few examples, at the beginning of the uh, 20th century, Tijuana is only 118 years old and has gone through about four or five shifts. One of the most important one, I think one of the most um, important economically as well as culturally was this relationship that Tijuana had with San Diego. Now our mayor in 2004, 2006 promised to convert the city of Tijuana to an equal or better city than San Diego. Well, that was a very cold idea. He was about 100 years uh, far from that idea. Uh, what Basically what happened, there was a connection between um, gambling, um, of course, uh, prohibition, that made Tijuana be part or an integral part of this operation. And Tijuana sort of became, uh, in the 1915, it had its first infrastructure, which was a, a, uh, a racetrack, and then became part of the San Diego, Arizona Eastern uh, Railway. Uh, and that infrastructure went into Tijuana, passed through the city, back into the United States, into Arizona. So it was a very important, a very important uh, infrastructure that connected both cities. And of course, you could go and fly from LA uh, to the Agua uh, Caliente Casino and gamble with the Hollywood celebrities. So this is just some images. Uh, everything went so well. Of course, the casino was designed by San Diego architect Wayne McAllister, San Diego LA architect Wayne McAllister when he was 18 years old. It was a $10 million project in the city. Basically, if we put numbers, if we put dollars uh, today, that's about a billion dollars. So it's one of the most expensive casinos ever built during that time. And it was so profitable that many Americans uh, decided to, uh, uh, to sometimes stay over in the United States. Um, after prohibition, the United States decided to close the border after 9 p.m. But um, because there was so much money coming in, the city of Tijuana, especially downtown Tijuana, had um, a very, an economic uh, surge of with uh, hotels and, uh, and other entertainment. So that's how it, the myths began of the city. Tijuana as a consequence of illegal acts of urbanism, basically the illegalities of one country come, uh, are what 
construct the city, um, the city of Tijuana. They say prohibited alter alterity, basically prohibited other, where we could go in infernal patterns, and it's only visited when nobody is watching. Then we had sort of this Tijuana, less than or equal to New York City fantasy that we had. Tijuana is a cosmopolitan idea. Basically, this also is a very important time economically in the city. Uh, it was a time uh, during the wars and also after the wars that uh, Tijuana actually had a lot of entertainment, uh, tourism, and it was a big part of the economy. It's actually the city of the Caesar, not the Rome Caesar, but the Caesar salad because the salad was invented in Tijuana during that time. So during this time, I'll go a little bit back, the city of Tijuana, that's the original plan of the city of Tijuana, based on a drawing by Ricardo Orozco, who was from Mexico City, 18, 1889, of course, it looks like a little bit of the city of Chicago. Same idea, French positivism, which is very, very important during that time in the country of Mexico, during, during the, uh, uh, the president of Porfirio Diaz. And here we have this very idealistic plan, which is not an American plan, like across the border, and it's not a colonial plan that you see in any parts of Mexico. It becomes something different. This is the beginning of the otherness. It becomes very different and new and, I guess, uh, positive for the city. But of course, if you look at, uh, to the right side of the plan, the, city, the citizens of Tijuana did not, want to have, did not want to have anything to do with that idea. Basically, what they started to happen is that these diagonals were began to be invaded, and the only diagonal that is basically left is a small street called Plaza Santa Cecilia, where you go and actually hire Mariachi for your birthday or for your quinceanera. Uh, so this idea of basically not even, um, it, there was an opportunity to become cosmopolitan. It was an opportunity to become itself a real, in, let's say, modern city. And there was two things that it basically neg negated that. One was that the city or the citizens were ready for that, and second, topography of the plan just basically couldn't work around its topography. There was a surge in the 50s, uh, the 40s and the 50s, uh, with a lot of servicemen coming into the city. Uh, there, was a, there were a lot of uh, clubs. Uh, there was some modern architecture in the city that started to talk about this cosmopolitan kind of view. There was money, there was invention, there was a cultural production, which was much more important. And this cultural production basically was a, a very particular style of jazz in the city. You see here, uh, Lizzie Gillespie, uh, of course, uh, the uh, Miles Davis Quintet, uh, Tony Williams, Wayne Shorter, Harry Hancock in a, a small little restaurant in Tijuana called the Capri. So there was a big production. This was Tijuana trying to be New York, or at least trying to be sort of like LA. It was so popular that it became a mood. A mood. It sort of became a kind of style to follow that many of the famous jazz sort of uh, musicians basically made it into a kind of uh, the Tijuana, created the Tijuana thing. So it's Charles Mingus, of course, Kurt Palbert, and uh, Gary McFarlane and Chuck Terry. Even if, even Tijuana made it into the history books of jazz, uh, because this is where uh, Jelly Roll Morton actually came and wrote the Kansas City Stomp. That is not in Kansas City, but there was a bar in Tijuana called Kansas City. Now this happens all the way to the 50s, the 60s. Uh, things change, of course, globalization, uh, very important. And also Mexico was very strong, nationalistic. Uh, we've had the PRI government now for about 40 years. It was very strong and it's, and it's trying to basically uh, homogenize an identity of Mexico and a power and of culture. And Tijuana had to be sort of Mexicanized because why Tijuana was not Mexico. And there was this be, uh, very large uh, urban uh, projects that actually uh, divided the city and did not connect to its original plan, original city. As you can see here, the Tijuana River Canal was a very important, uh, in that time, a very important infrastructure. Uh, it was a concrete channel that today is actually uh, more, it's more functional, so that we don't know what to do with it anymore. Uh, there's a lot of environmental pro problems with it, but it actually cut through the city. On the right side, you see, you see a boulevard that has um, a series of rows of trees uh, that curves back and sort of to the top of the screen. Uh, and that's Paseo de los Héroes based on Paseo de Reforma, so, which is in Mexico City. So this was a, an intention sort of to Mexicanize it, to bring Mexican culture to the city of Tijuana. And we had some of our most uh, important and architectural works at that time in a sort of Mexican institutional modernism. So next, 
After that, in continuing with that, the 1970s and even towards this, uh, you know, uh, the NAFTA agreements, we had the Mequiladora uh, industry or the Mequiladora programs, manufacturing plants from all over the world, basically to assemble everything. Electronics, textiles, um, uh, there's even aerospace industries, everything. And this was very important in a sense that it created or made Tijuana one of the cities with less unemployment in the whole country, and it still is. Uh, Tijuana is growing at 6% a year, and that because of the Mequiladora industry. And this is what happens that Tijuana now becomes a place for immigrants and not just a springboard uh, to the United States. So now they become a place, we have all these uh, basically what we call slums or basically uh, illegal settlements of the city that have been so much romanticized as bottom-up urbanisms uh, or in a way um, uh, these new types of urbanisms but they have never really created anything uh, that would be in a way in a positive sense uh, as a citywide level. So as you can see very briefly what happened is that these maquiladora industries uh, started to move away from the border and they started to settle basically where the new immigrants were coming and feeding off because they knew that was going to be their label force and these three maps basically show uh, the first one with the blue basically shows where are the uh, the, the manufacturing density, meaning where are the manufacturing parks. To your right, you have the lower wages in the city, and at the bottom you have, of course, the industrial parks, and you can see these three things are related, and that's how the system is working. So a very centralized core of social and economic uh, wealth, and then it moves out to the periphery and it gets lower very different to San Diego or San Diego or similar to LA that wealth is distributed in subcenters. In this case we only have one subcenter. So it's very difficult for people to live, it's very expensive to live outside the city because if they need to travel for services um, or to buy goods they have to go to the center and infrastructure, transportation infrastructure is not adequate. And one of the solutions that uh, we had for the illegal settlements of these hills because of the Mequiladora uh, project was uh, basically to subsidize uh, housing and let developers, private developers, build it. Eventually, this is what we got. Uh, a solution turned into a much major problem. These small, functional, very small, even 350 square feet houses uh, that were just basically built in the last 15 years, thousands of these, because the one has a shortage of housing of about 77,000 homes every year because of migration. So this was supposed to be the cure for the informalities. I think this is my last slide. So I'll just stop with that and there's hopefully a bit of more. Okay, thank you very much, Renee. I am going to uh, open our panel discussion. I wanted to just make two comments. Um, I was just Googling the, uh, the origin of the words ecology and economy and I found out that they're both from the Greek oikos. Um, oikos meaning house, and it, it, that's the root of, of uh, ecology. But the root of economy is actually uh, from the Latin oikonomia or oikonomos, which is the Greek, which was manager of household. And it's interesting to me that the, 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 the primary sort of themes of today's discussion have moved off the issue of capital to the issue of, of resources. And we can think of resources specifically to do with the environment. I think this is an interesting place to start the discussion because the question, I think, of management of economy and management of environment seem really on the table today. So I'm going to open it up to our panel and I'm going to try to call Dan and Amal in the meantime. Anybody want to take that on? <laughs> or say something else? Actually, 
part of it, a big part of its ecological idea, in a sense. Uh, in relation to San Diego, San Diego grew facing the ocean. It always had had a relationship with the ocean, a relationship with the environment. Well, Tijuana had always basically, it, was even, it wasn't accessible until the 1950s, the, at least the Pacific Ocean, or the beaches of the city. So there was um, a very interesting, there's, there's a kind of a dynamic that happens in the city of Tijuana where we sort of fight topography and we fight geography while our neighbor to the north basically tries to create a kind of symbiotic relationship with, uh, uh, within it. So um, as, as, you, as you can see in some of the images. Just briefly, I, um, Peter, you talk about resources as distinct from capital, or capital as being one of the essential resources, so to speak. I think they're becoming, real or I mean fictional or real. I think they're becoming indistinguishable. It, it seems to me that, that the subject of city development can't be decoupled from environmental issues, but we also have to understand that cities now participate in terms of their ecological footprint not just as a kind of economies of capital, but also economies of resource. If we could extend the idea from uh, the idea of, of the city as the sum of its capital investments, perhaps to something more like the city as the kind of uh, sum of its, its ecological potential in some ways. I, I, I'm just starting to think that, that from having seen these presentations today, there, that there's clearly uh, an instinct now towards trying to, from an architectural perspective and an urban design or urban analysis perspective, look at the city more broadly and, and understand it um, not just in terms of um, its particular kind of fiscal or financial instruments, uh, which is one way to classically talk about development there, as there's, an investment device. There's, I mean, this reminds me, there's this, um, I think his name is David Grange, Graham Shane, this, this idea of the recombinant city I mean, I mean, from my perspective, as somebody involved with, with art culture, so to speak, I mean, he has this idea of this idea where it gets from Foucault in terms of a notion of sort of heterotopic zones uh, that, that pertains to architecture, development, urbanism, and of course, some aspect of art culture. I'm wondering if the idea, and he, and he goes through, of course, Kevin Lynch's notion of sort of organic or, eco, or organic city, and then into sort of broader ecologies, metaphorically, and I'm wondering if a lot of what we saw today, to a certain extent, is about this idea of a recombinant city, just to throw that out. Yeah, this is really interesting to me, something that I've noticed um, throughout the history of thinking about the city in a systemic way, going back to uh, the Chicago School and Park and Burgess, is the influence of whatever the current hard technology, for lack of a better term, or high technology of the era, and using that as a metaphor for understanding the city. So for example, in the, in the 90s and 2000s, I read one more article about the city as a network. It was going to barf. I mean, it was, uh, that was the overwhelming. And then you look at Park and Burgess and their discussion of invasion and secession, and their explicit borrowing of, the, uh, of ideas from evolutionary ecology and the ecology of the evolution of organism and applying that to cities. The reason why I caution that is that when you start taking some of these uh, naturalistic or physical scientific um, metaphors to the city, it obscures some very important social relations, and particularly power, how it's exercised, um, force, uh, externality, who pays, who wins, who loses. And it's very easy then to accept things it's kind of a natural, organic uh, mode of organization within the city. So uh, they may be interesting as a heuristic device to sort of open up how the city works, but it does always raise my back. Uh, but I'm thinking more about resource management in, in some ways. Maybe less the kind of idea of the model of the city as a natural system. Um, Peter, to that um, comment, it seems to me we're not going to be building much right. for a while, right? So isn't it essentially now that we're not looking at how to build cities or is it networked or again, it's out of our control because we don't, we're not going to build anything anymore as builders. So when you talk about resources, I think you just said it's about managing resources, but it's about now maybe understanding how to unlock the, 
potential of the city, not as top-down architects and developers and planners, but as bottom-up responders to forces that, again, probably are organic, but you can see it with Obama unleashing a whole grassroots campaign. I think it's those kinds of forces, if architecture and design could dovetail with them and interact with them, can create something that feels you know, certainly responsive, but also proactive, right? Because we can't just sit around for the next 10 years, right? Yeah, and you know, and, and, and some watchwords that I think we should take into our practice and looking forward at this intermediate uh, time period will be notions of reoccupation, reuse, preservation of the existing built capital stock. Not just buildings, but also, hey, we have a centuries worth of street sewers, street lights, water treatment systems that our uh, ancestors paid for that we can't replicate. So we can't afford to have junk space in the city anymore. We can't afford to have stranded infrastructure. And, and just on a real basic economic level, that happens on a social and ecological level. We have to ask ourselves, what do we do with that patrimony and resources that, that are available to us? I would be concerned about um, the, 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 the potential, I mean, since we're here in an architecture school, the idea that a building is defunct for the next 10 years um, could be construed as defeatist. I mean, I completely understand what Stephanie's suggesting in, in, in relation to her practice. It, make, it makes sense, and I, and I understand as a kind of metaphor, um, but clearly, if there's going to be a repricing of certain things, whether of natural resources, of services, of skill, you know, of how skill set is are instrumentalized in relation to you know, deflationary environment, perhaps. Um, that building could proceed just as any kind of cultural production could proceed, perhaps in a um, reconfigured way in terms of the economics of it all. So, and what I meant by, I mean, I'm, the Graham Shane book is just, is just one book, but the notion of I mean, from an art world, from an art point of view, obviously there are artists who like to deal with questions of intervention. I mean, that's and that's a whole that's a loaded term, and the question of how much can be planned and how much can should happen in terms of issues of social movements, right? I mean, the Obama situation was a thoroughly planned. Um, I wouldn't even call it bottom up. I would call it um, I don't know what synchronic movement of various echelons. Um, to invoke a Hegelian notion, I guess, that, that, that Rene did, but um, uh, a conspiracy, if you will, of forces in the best possible sense. Um, so I think the issue of building is essential. Uh, the question of how much can be planned out and whether the very structures that are utilized for competitions, for example, I mean, we just saw, you know, um, uh, the, uh, what are their names, the two individuals who just presented? Uh, work. Right, work, okay. And, and Ultimately, their, their project was not, it didn't win that competition. So maybe the whole notion of a competition needs to shift as well in terms of its infrastructures and its power relations. Um, just as in the realm of cultural art production, we need to rethink the structures by which artists have an opportunity to function within public space, whatever that may or may not mean at this point.
sewer systems that are as dated. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done in the city between, let's say, Stephanie's scale and Kevin's scale. It may require the architects and urbanists, urbanists to change their focus. We may not be making buildings. We may actually be putting together proposals for infrastructural improvement. Me uh, Measure R just got passed, uh, and we're looking there at a significant investment in bringing infrastructure back up to speed in Southern California. But it seems to me that some questions need to be asked. I mean, is this just a, a repair effort? So are we just going to go pot, patch sort of potholes and, and, and fix our streets? Or are there opportunities within discussions of uh, things like the high-speed train, for instance, to talk about urbanism and to talk about the sorts of spaces that these, these new systems will produce? And, and, and I would say again to the audience of practitioners and students, you have immediately a battle to join, a small p political battle. And that is, who controls this discourse? Is it going to be the civil engineers, or are other people going to have a seat at the table? The experience of uh, other, you know, uh, Caltrans, as you know, you go to Caltrans, you talk to a civil engineer, they give you the program, uh, the pattern book, and that's what you can deal with, uh, and it ends there. So, uh, where are your opportunities for innovation in that discussion? And I think also uh, at the level of, of people who are leading research and thinking in our profession and aligned field, we really need to be very aggressive about uh, entering that discussion with the civil engineers 
such that uh, they don't control it or, or, or have privilege within the discourse. Richard, um, would you be thinking that, that we would need to be looking at our completely new paradigm in terms of, um, of what design is They need to view housing as that because people living near their jobs, living in places where they don't have to get in their cars, both good for the environment and, and good for, in my opinion, good for society. But I think what's interesting in some conversations <clears throat> I've had and others have had um, is, the, is the whole idea that the people who employ the, 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 uh, the population, you know, can't they subsidize the housing for the population? I mean, it's, it's almost a almost a, a, a socialist idea, right, is that there, there's this idea that, that housing is provided and everything's provided and it all just sort of works. Now maybe that term's a little loaded, particularly in today's political environment, but that's the idea, you know. So, so there should be shared costs and the people, the people who use it and who benefit from it need to all contribute into it. I would say that that's, that's an opportunity. I don't know how it all comes together, but, but we're, we're, I'm going to, um, I'm just going to, I'm going to interrupt you. We have New York on the line, so I'm going to try to uh, see if we can get Dan in the mall. Can I ask one question, just maybe more rhetorical, but also practical? When people talk about you know this idea of, of facilitating um, people working close to their jobs, what does that really mean? Does that mean that the, the employers are going to move closer to, to, the, to where those people may or may not be living, or vice versa? Are they going to be in between? I'm talking about the LA environment. So I, that, and I've seen a lot of discussion writings about this recently, but what does that really mean on a pragmatic basis? The people who work no, I mean, in the banks in downtown LA, they may or may not want to live in downtown where I currently live. Uh, they may want to live in Beverly Hills. So I'm, I'm, this is a confusing issue. I'm wondering if maybe... A couple of things that you can see sort of empirically. Uh, one of the things that's really neat right now, and, and absent any kind of policy or any kind of decision, we saw a real run-up in a premium on housing that was located near employment centers. So if you think of Los Angeles as having this polynucleated structure, and Century City, for example, has more square feet of office space than Cincinnati, or downtown Long Beach has larger employment concentration than Milwaukee. Suddenly now we begin to see, because you got to think in terms of those scales, a, a real run-up in desire strictly on the basis of market mechanisms for uh, housing 
in those locations where the, the opportunity cost and real cost of transportation uh, is reduced. Now here's the interesting thing. The codes had to come and catch up. And we saw some things like the adaptive reuse ordinance that allowed for residential use to uh, infiltrate what had been completely commercial in the downtown. So some sort of codes lag. We're now using uh, the specific plan uh, zoning mechanism as a, as a technical tool in, in California planning law to um, create new environments that allow things some like LA Live, okay, we have residential there into the downtown, you know, it's uh, like a little Las Vegas. But in other places, though, it's used as a, uh, as a way to um, interject and mediate density and yields to meet this market demand for employment locations near residents. And then also the nature of work has changed. One of the fascinating things about employment in Southern California is that there are very few, uh, relative to the size of the economy, major employers. It's fragmented. And so again, that fragmentation and flexibility has expressed itself in the built environment here. So uh, it's a funny question, and I think it, 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 to, to, to the related company's business model, no, 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 sorry. <laughs> sorry. That's okay. Uh, but, but, uh, no offense. Anyone but them. But, but to anyone interested in urban, in providing urban and real, uh, residential, to anyone who's interested in providing urban residential products, uh, that's that trend or that direction back to that. David, I'm going to, um, I'm going to try here. I think Amal wants to say something, so here we go. If, I mean, we, we just wanted to uh, thank everyone for the great discussion and also sort of add that, um, I mean, it's a, it's a sort of very, we see a very interesting intersection where sort of liberal wild capitalism is in shock, uh, um, wild urbanization is in shock, and the environment is in shock. Um, so uh, this intersection is really ripe for, uh, in a way, two, two modes of operation if we're able to do that. Uh, on the one hand, as architects and urbanists, we can, our role, uh, our, the opportunity that we have is to, uh, uh, to imagine uh, uh, other urbanists uh, and we can go very wild uh, in, in terms of this imagination and for, and it's been a long time uh, that, uh, that we haven't had a voice like this where there is an audience today uh, ready to listen to, yet yeah, how do you rethink the city, how do you rethink the, uh, the suburb, how we think the excerpt, et cetera, beyond sort of uh, to uh, individual flows and, and feeling part of this. So there, there's that line, which is purely uh, one's imagination and vision and, 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 and sort of uh, understanding, you know, the tools that we have. And then, and, and, and then on the pragmatic level, because we are engaged with the world, is 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 that sort of like Stephanie was saying to find both operation. So uh, or, or you know mapping to. Tijuana or taking this work, etc. To you know, sort of set of working with engineers, working you know, working in policy, whatever, to, to sort of frame a context within which uh, one can find uh, uh, action uh, as small or, or as big as, as possible, whether it's infrastructure, building, land building. Uh, I think I think that uh, I think we as architects, our generation today is quite flexible in terms of stretching the boundaries of uh, what we call our discipline. And so we, we trust that this is kind of maybe uh, a, Yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're quite optimistic about the ability, at least of our generation, to straddle. I mean, we've been able to straddle kind of lines between theory and practice. And I think at this moment, uh, you know, in the last time everything went dark economically, there was a lot of invention kind of formally and theoretically. Uh, uh, I think our generation is able to kind of straddle both on to hopefully discover the way and of practice or the ways of uh, injecting ourselves into a process even uh, in a maybe even more inventive way. I just want to raise a couple of, a couple of topics and I guess address some comments here. Um, but what of this idea of potential hypothetical idea of say the introduction of a, a numerical or a possible North American magazine of the next five years? How does that you know, impact both the notion of order and these ideas of uh, new economy. I, you know, uh, I don't have a lot of anything really important to say about the notion of a, of a strengthening hemispheric block 
except to say that uh, it is likely that uh, as uh, capitalism grows and, and, and recovers from this current crisis, we will continue to see uh, increased interdependence between regions and economies. And finally, at the bottom of that list, nation states that will, will be less important as the principal organizer of the union for uh, free economic structures. I guess what I can say about that in regards to the Mexican side, the NAFTA agreement wasn't that for us. It was a sour deal. I mean, basically what it did is destroy agriculture in the country. So you can destroy agriculture. Um, from what I heard, I think Obama's going to rethink NAFTA. Hopefully he does. Um, then that's how Tijuana in the last 30 years, or since NAFTA, well, NAFTA hasn't been for that long, but we've been a, <clears throat> basically a manufacturing free trade zone for a long time. And that has really flooded uh, uh, the city with immigrants, but looking for, for, for labor and jobs, and like I said, it's a city that is growing and has very little unemployment. These are very low wage jobs. And that's what we've become. We, instead of producing our own food, we have to then participate in, in this sort of uh, three-part agreement, right? And we have become a society of low-paying uh, workers. Okay, are there any final comments from the panel or thoughts? Are we going to wrap up on that? change.gov, there's a, there's a, no, 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 I, I mean, I think that we get, you know, so the RFP is written for a civil engineer, but also we have the, you know, the architectural or cultural, you know, it's, it's, I think it's going to take a lot of agitating, you know, high-level letters to the editor, and maybe even to the point of standing in front of the bulldozers, like, was the case with the interstate highway system. Jane Jay was stopping the, the, the Greenwich Village Freeway or whatever it was because I don't know to what extent that, that counter discourses will turn out. And um, you know, keep an eye out for it. That's what I would say. Keep an but eye you, you know, I, I think to a certain extent, the, the idea of architects, planners, and interim designers being service providers has to sort of move forward. I think that we need to be more entrepreneurial in some ways. Uh, Stephanie is, is somebody who's got an interesting model of being quite an activist in terms of getting the work out. Um, but also starting projects. I mean, actually initiating projects. I, I think that's, can I, that's a, can go I ahead. just do a one sentence pitch for my... <laughs> sure. <laughs> and, and fair enough, uh, there'd be every reason that you would think that all EcoShack does is small green buildings, because that is kind of what we do, but I'm evolving Evolving our business model a little bit um, towards where I think is the next generation of green. And I think the next generation of green is exactly what we're talking about and what you kicked this off with, Peter, which is resource sharing. And um, so I started a side company called Want to Start a Commune to reintroduce the commune typology into the 21st century. And our first project is called Cul-de-Sac Commune. And going into cul-de-sacs in Los Angeles and joining with the neighbors there to share resources and essentially turn their cul-de-sac into a commune. Commune, I love because it's so political as an idea and this project is entirely designed to rebrand the idea of commune and reintroduce it. The definition of commune on Wikipedia is a community that shares resources. So we've got five cul-de-sac communes starting in Los Angeles starting in Oakland, so it's actually already instantly kind of interesting and happening. Um, as an architect, I'm just a witness to how people come together. I'm interested in developing a whole host of products and other opportunities to monetize this idea. Don't think I'm not going to. But the first phase is actually just kind of experimental and petri dish. And I like LA because we have a lot of suburban cul-de-sacs in urban conditions, right? So we're the perfect marriage of suburban and urban, so this is a great place to test that. 
So I just wanted to kind of introduce that as an example of why I feel so incredibly optimistic about the challenges that we're confronting, because we are going to be forced, completely a thousand percent forced, to redefine what architects are in the 21st century. And it's happening right now, and it'll happen over the next 10 years. So I'm thrilled to be exactly the right age to kind of dive into that. <laughs> I've got to tell you. You're never too old to teach. Well, but you know what? There's a good place and time for it, and it's now. So I'm excited. I think that's a, if I may say that's a nice place to wrap so we can take some questions from the audience because people are getting fidgety. But, but certainly now is a very interesting time to live in, and I would agree that as an architect, um, you know, as, as dire as things seem, uh, whether we're on a U or an L or a V, maybe a W, who knows, um, you know, we're bound to go somewhere. So hopefully we can get the bottom. Um, why don't we take some questions if there are some from the audience? I'm going to give you the mic. Wireless mic, unfortunately. Are you familiar with is the reality of what the market demand is. 